as we bring our gifts, we dedicate ourselves to the Lord. We certainly are dedicating our, our financial gift, but we place this emphasis um, on our, our attitude and where our commitment is. Um, recognizing that just, just paying a dollar amount um, is kind of like paying the electric bill without thinking about what the electricity does for you, or, or paying the water bill without thinking of uh, the many benefits of that water that piped right into your house. We come with an intentionality of recognizing the ways that we have been blessed and, and finding ways to joyfully, uh, enthusiastically give, whether it be through finances or give through our time, our, our natural talents, our spiritual gifts, and to give those things. And, and there's something to be said for that getting the heart condition uh, involved there. Because let's face it, even if you really appreciate the electric service you had, maybe you had a storm and you were out without power for two days and what a relief when it came back on. Maybe you really appreciate because you've been somewhere where you didn't get fresh water pumped directly out. Even if you really appreciate this thing, I bet you never are tempted to send an over and above gift to those utility companies. But see, when we dedicate in our hearts first what we bring to the Lord, we find room to give something more, something beyond. We find an opportunity to stretch in our usefulness to the kingdom, our intentionality about what we do in the name of Jesus. And so when we dedicate our offering, it's not merely that the financial gifts get used uh, wisely and that they have great benefit to the kingdom, but we're dedicating ourselves and our enthusiasm for the kingdom work. Let's even now offer that dedicatory prayer. Holy God, thank you for what you've done for us through Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you have done for us through the power of your Spirit. Thank you for the awakening of our own spiritual gifts. And allow us to thank you, to show our appreciation by bringing back some of this giftedness, by returning to you from the abundance with which you have blessed us. As we bring these our gifts, examine our hearts and see that indeed we are cheerful givers, that we want to be used by you, that we want to volunteer for whatever might be next. We eagerly anticipate how we can be part of sharing that gospel message, that we can let others know the love that we have come to know. So, Father, receive now these gifts. Receive us. Bless these things. Bless us. That these gifts, that I may be used in your name, in the same name. Our hymn, Rejoice the Lord is King. If you're at home using a hymnal, you might find that on, uh, from, if you're using a hymnal from Scotch Plains Baptist, hymn number 276. Otherwise, it's included in your worship packet. Rejoice the Lord is King. <clears throat>
join together in what we refer to as our pastoral prayer. Again, pastoral not because the pastor has the microphone, but pastoral in that it's for our care for one another. It's our care for the sheep in the pasture. Pastoral prayer. We've shared, even today, um, earlier in the service, we shared um, some names and some specific situations. We know that there are prayer lists that you are part of, that you receive, and that many of you keep um, prayer lists, and, and uh, not only the, the prayers, but the answers to prayers. We recognize that there are incidents and experience throughout your week that prompt you to prayer. Um, and some of those are just kind of immediate um, pistol prayers, you fire one off, uh, and you move on. And some of those kind of stick with you. Uh, and you reflect back on them later in the day, and you pray for that. Again, it might have been something that you witnessed, but you didn't know who was involved. You didn't know details, but you, you prayed for that. And then later you circle back to that. And say, I, whatever that was going on there, I, I continue to pray for that. Or somebody that shared something with you, and you said, I'll pray for you. And hopefully you prayed as you said that, but now you remember, oh, that's right, I, I need to be praying for that situation. So sometimes we have things that have been on our prayer list and been part of our intentional prayer, sometimes for years. And sometimes there are things that are just one-offs. And it's all part of our prayer life. Our prayer doesn't have to be the big, major incident. We don't have to reserve for um, life-threatening experiences or headline prayers. But our prayers can be kind of, well, back in the day when there were newspapers and we read them and you had those pages of notices. This little tiny bit. Our prayers can be like those. Maybe perhaps not paid attention to by the vast majority of the folks, but something that was important to us and important to someone else. And they might be one-shot deals. And that's just part of our prayer life. And so in our pastoral prayer together, it's the same way. We might have some things that there's a name that you've never heard before. <clears throat> you don't know the person, but somebody shared that with you and we present that as part of our pastoral prayer on a given Sunday. And others that you heard about on more than one occasion, you continue to pray with whoever has brought that concern. Or someone who just says, you know what, I, I, I know I've said it before, but I got praise the Lord for this, and you join with them. And so our prayer, our corporate prayer, is very much similar to our individual prayer. And I don't think, and again, I don't, I, I'm not a great theologian, and I've never written a book on prayer or anything like that, but I don't think that God weighs one of those differently than the other. I don't think he ranks them and says, well, here's the A-League prayers, and, you know, that's the AAA prayer down there. He receives each one of our prayers with his fullest attention. The one who knows if a sparrow falls or if you lose a hair from your head cares about each of our prayers, individually and as a body. So we bring these things before him today. We pray for and with one another. Holy God, thank you. Thank you that you are a God who hears our prayers. That you're not merely a God that makes us go through a psychological effort. And that somehow in that we're supposed to achieve something. That you don't make us go through a practice as mere discipline. But that when we come before you in prayer, that the God of the universe listens to me. 
that the God who created all around us listens to my prayer when I don't know the name and I don't have all the facts. I'm not even sure exactly what was happening, but I know there's a need of prayer. My God hears, listens, and answers. And so we today bring these our prayers. We pray for the ones we've lost, even in recent days, a former pastor, a brother, son, grandson. We pray for the unnamed thousands who will remember on Memorial Day, who lost their lives in service to their country. We recognize the many, the countless men and women who have put on the uniform knowing that there was risk involved. Knowing that their name might be recalled some memorial day. We're thankful that the vast majority survived their time in service. But we appreciate their call. And on this day, we remember those who gave their lives. We don't always recognize the silent stones of veteran cemeteries. We sometimes see a beautiful picture and are moved by it. But we don't often reflect back on those names. We recognize that even in a small cemetery like ours here at Scotch Plains Baptist, there are scattered veterans' markers. And we might not always call them to mind, but on this day, we do. Particularly, those who lost lives in battle. We honor them with our thoughts. We pray today not only for those we've lost, but for those we've gained. We think of the one for whom we've been praying that we heard has delivered a baby boy. And for the other that we're expecting that news any time now. We're praying for the newlywed couple and the life that they're beginning together. We're praying for the life changes that are taking place with those who have recently graduated from high school and college and those who are counting down the days to that graduation and the next we celebrate with them. We eagerly anticipate where their steps might take them and even now pray over those steps. We pray over the steps of all those who are undergoing challenging experiences. We think of our young people as they're developing their sense of self and their identity and the many things that pull them in multiple directions, we ask that you help guide them into 
the safe steps. For those beginning new careers, for those who are even now entering military service and facing first deployment, and those who are leaving military service and finding challenge in adapting to a new lifestyle. Finding it difficult to take those highly trained skill sets that they have and translate them into a different world. And those that while they might have left fields of combat, have only left bodily, and their minds and their spirits are still there. We pray for their transition, for their peace, for their wholeness and wellness. We pray for our communities. We recognize community has differing contexts. We know there's a community within our churches. There's a community within our family. There's a community within our geographic area and our zip code defined geography. There's community in the people that we choose to volunteer with or associate with. Community in our places of employment and in our schools. And we recognize that each community has its own dynamics. And that many of us have our feet in several different communities. Each with their own joys and stresses. We pray now for our, our communities that you allow us there to be sources of, of light and hope and truth and inspiration of encouragement. And that in our communities, we might find those same things. We'd ask that you help us to be your church even when we're not in church. But then whatever community that we find ourselves, we can boldly bear the name of Jesus. That we can be an influencer for your kingdom. Lord, we have extensive prayer lists. Some names that we heard for the first time today some scenarios that we've not encountered until we were here. And others that we've been praying for for a while. And those things that we're not even sure what we're praying about, we just feel led in our spirit to pray. We bring all of these before you. And rely on your spirit to speak them before your throne. Hear, Lord, now these are prayers. Offered in the name of Jesus Christ. challenge, and, and I actually shared a reference to a, a specific um, pastoral colleague um, who talked about having never preached a Mother's Day sermon, you know, sticking to the things of the church. Um, and that is a challenge to try to figure out milestone events and how they relate to what we do together. 
And there are some things in the spaces that are very, I know it's a trademark, but very hallmark. Boss's Day. I don't think we've ever done a Boss's Day sermon. I do know that I have shared administrative professional segments. Pretty much a hallmark holiday. And I've certainly shared Mother's Day and Father's Day. We've shared graduation. And I kind of wonder sometimes those who take pride in the fact that they've always stuck to the church calendar, they sneak in a, a graduation sermon now and then. Memorial Day is not a church holiday. It's not on a church calendar. It's not in an electionary reading or a liturgical calendar. But it is a worthy cause to think of those who have, as Scripture might say, laid down their life for a friend. And so we do take some time and we do remember Memorial Day. I, I can't help but think about my own experience growing up where Memorial Day was, I don't want to say it was a sacred holiday in my family, but it was an important one. And there was a bit of Solemnity and making sure that the American flag was just right as it hung from our front porch. Or in the years that we actually had a flagpole in the front yard, flag on that. It was also an opportunity to go to the cemetery and plant flowers, decoration day. And in my home church growing up, the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend was for the roll call. And the reading of the names of those from the congregation who had passed in the past year. And I have this indelible image in my mind when I was in college of being asked to read the roll call. And I was asked probably because on that list was my best friend from when we were little boys growing up in that church who was diagnosed when we were in high school with a, a brain tumor and eventually brain tumor one. And that Memorial Day I read that list that was in calendar order and I knew his name was coming. There was a catharsis, I believe, in standing there in our home church, the incubator of, of my faith and Teddy's faith. Teddy. I was Chucky. He was Teddy. <clears throat> By the time our high school was Ted and Jazz. There was something about standing there amidst that family. And for me to read his name on that day. Now I know the technical decorating the graves of ancestors, great aunts and uncles that I had never met isn't technically what Memorial Day is about. I know that reading the names not what really Memorial Day is about. But I believe there's something to be said for the value that we give And if we find value in putting some 
flowers on a grave, or, or was often the case in my family, planting petunias. If there's something that you find in value on this Memorial Day, to think of those who you lost who had nothing to do with military service. that that can become a sacred moment. And again, it might not be on the church calendar. But I think it can be that sacred time where God can speak into the practical realness, the reality of your lived experience. And so I believe it's okay today to perhaps expand on the definition of what Memorial Day means without leaving behind its most sacred moment. And so as you're driving through town, you're seeing those banners, you're looking for the names you know, names from church or from family or from the community, people that you have experienced. It's okay. But it's Memorial Day. Not all those people died in service. It's okay to honor them and reflect on them. I, I can't help but connect Memorial Day and my dad. Now, my dad's still with us. He's turning 99 in two days. He served in World War II. 16 million men and women served in World War II. Right now, about 167,000 of them are left. 1% are still living. By next year, it's expected there will be about 84%. Half of the World War II veterans who are alive today will likely not be here a year from now. I can't help but connect those ideas and the fact that my dad's part of that 1%. And I have no idea if next year he'll be part of that half a percent. And so I can't help but think of of my dad. And that might seem to some to be self-serving. That it might seem to be attention calling. But I believe that in this setting that it can be a sacred moment as well. And perhaps Perhaps I do a disservice because maybe those statistics and my dad are statistics to you. And that maybe I take time to share what's for me. Maybe that's a bit selfish. But perhaps in my sharing that it calls to mind one of your neighbors or one of your relatives, somebody that you knew who is still one of that 1%. Or the great uncle that you never knew because he never came home from Europe or the Pacific or the China, Burma, India theater or Korea or Vietnam or Afghanistan. And maybe it opens the door for a sacred moment for you. And I got to believe that that's what we're to be about. That we could come and gather in the church. And we could read the readings. And sing the songs present our gifts 
and never yet encounter a sacred moment, then we might have been in church, but we missed church. And so we pray by the Spirit that what we do can connect us, can deepen our relationship with God and how He speaks into our lives and how He hears what we speak back. That we can find on this side of the stained glass or the other those sacred moments that allow us to just breathe into the Spirit and have the Spirit breathe in to us. Many of you know that I, I don't have the typical preacher education. And I don't know Greek and Hebrew. And I've only picked up a few things and my pronunciations are all wrong. And I rely on scholars. You used to rely on books, but now a lot of it's right on your phone and the internet. I rely on those sources to help me identify those words and phrases and seek to understand them. And when I talk about finding that sacred and breathing in spirit, it's one of the few Hebrew words that I do connect well with. Ruach means spirit. It means wind. It means breath. Depending on how it's used in a sentence, changes its, its meaning and its understanding, or sometimes maybe it doesn't. Our call to worship this morning, we read from Psalm 104. And we read, praise the Lord, my soul, Lord, my God, you are very great. We read the Lord wraps himself in light. We read, he makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. We read verse 30, when you send your spirit, winds and spirit and breath, all ruah. I have in my mind this understanding that when we read the Genesis account and God takes dust and he forms man and he breathes into him, I have in my mind that he breathes into him the physical breath of the body, but he spirits into him that thing that makes us created in the image of God that sets eternity in us, that links us to that great spirit. And so when we find that sacred moment that is in a deep breath or in a gasp or in a sigh, that spirit and breath are linked together. And when I talk about things like when we mature in our prayer life so that our breathing is prayer, that makes sense, at least in my mind, that our breathing is our spiriting, and that in all we do, we're connecting to God. I believe that that's a, a kind of learning curve to get there. I believe it's a, it's, it, it's a development. I think it's a biblical development of how spirit works. 
how God, through the Holy Spirit, interacts with humanity. That that link was always established from the time of the Garden of Eden when God breathed life into Adam. Awaiting the time when Adam, the fallen, accepts the new covenant in Jesus Christ, and experiences restoration, and receives that spirit, the Holy Spirit that bridges that gap again. I think the Bible lays out how that moves for us. One of the lectionary readings on this day, on this day where we try to find that sacred encounter, that sacred moment. One of the readings comes from the Old Testament, from Numbers chapter 11. <clears throat> and this passage comes in the middle of, a, of a, a, a scenario, a scene where Moses is struggling with the people. And they're grumbling and complaining, and they've received the manna, but they, they're tired of it. That same diet, day after day, they want something more. They, they demand meat. And Moses has had enough. And he has the audacity to go to God and say, you know what? I'm tired of these people. If this is what you called me to, then just kill me now. You thought that was kind of a new expression. Moses was saying it back in the day. God said, come here, Moses. And Moses got closer. Probably expecting some vengeful spiting. God said, I got gotcha. you. Once you go out and get some leaders who are going to take some of this burden from you. And this is kind of where we pick it up. Numbers chapter 11, verse 24. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. That was the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him. And he, the Lord, not he, Moses, he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him, on Moses, and put it on the 70 elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they did not do so again. So God has Moses gather these 70, bring them, call them from among the people, and bring them to the tent of meeting. And God places the Spirit on them. Now, I find that interesting because we don't talk about the Spirit being on someone, but we talk about the Spirit being in someone. And I think that's intentional language. And I think we see that through the Old Testament where the Spirit comes and rests on someone. And then sometimes, well, The Spirit moves on. The Spirit comes as a messenger for a given moment. And I think we see it very clearly here. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do so again. The Spirit came and they prophesied. Now, we're not exactly told what exactly prophecy meant. Did it mean they were you know, telling the future? Probably not. Um, did it mean that they were speaking in tongues? Probably not not? Does it mean that they were just in this um, excitement, this, this fervor? Probably not. But one of those understandings of prophesying by the Spirit is speaking truth. Speaking what God has said and helping people to understand it as being true. Some of you might say, well, I've never prophesied. 
But if you took scripture and by the power of the spirit, you opened somebody's eyes to it, you were actually prophesying right then. That shock anybody to know that you might have done that? Because we don't, we don't see that for ourselves. And frankly, often when we see it, we see, that we see it with accusation of some charlatan claiming the ability to prophesy. But when we speak truth, when we foretell, not foretell, but speak forth the truth, we are prophesying. I, I believe that that's what happened. That, that they were able to, through the Spirit, speak the truth of what God was doing, and it was a sign for those around them. So that these 70, as they are consecrated, that with the Spirit resting on them, they're able to prophesy, and that becomes a sign that others should believe what they say. Trust in their powers, just like we trusted in Moses as being a spokesperson for God. We should trust in them. And then they did not do it again because they didn't need to. They'd established their credentials. And there's a little side story in here. However, this is uh, this is the 26. However, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. So when the 70 that Moses called came, two didn't actually come. I don't know why they didn't come. Did they think it was nonsense? Were they mad at Moses? Were they kind of, were they kind of some of the rabble rousers that said, hey, no, 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 you're not sucking me in over there? Completely opposite. Were they so humble that, no, I don't deserve to be part of that. I'm not worthy of that. I can't do that. Were they too scared? What kind of stress might I fall under if I do that? They remained in camp. They were listed among the elders, but they did not go out to the tent. Yet, the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua. We know Joshua. Joshua, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Somebody came and tattled that two of those guys are prophesying, and they weren't out here. And Joshua, they, wait, 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 that they deliberately chose not to listen to Moses when he said to come here. But their names were already on God's list, and God gave them that spirit, and Moses wasn't about to take it away. Moses said, you know what? I wish that not only those two out there, but the thousands that were out there all had the Spirit on them. Because then they could all do this without us having it, and my burden would be relieved. They could have direct access. They wouldn't have to rely on an infallible, or a fallible Moses. They would have an infallible Spirit in their lives. I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets. And then they went back to the camp. And God sent the birds. And it depends on your commentator, your commentary and reading, your Bible translator, what version you read. Either birds came so that they were three feet deep on the ground, piled three feet deep, or others translate that as they were flying so low they were flying at three feet and they were so tired, and people were literally snatching birds out of the air. They wanted meat, God gave them meat. And they snatched those birds and they ate. And they ate until they got sick. And some actually died. In the middle of all that, they want meat. They're not getting meat. God sends the meat. And they get sick from it. In the middle of that, we get this. God sends his spirit. In the middle of confusion and chaos and a desire for control, God brings his spirit. And sometimes when we get what we wanted, it turns out it's not so good for us. It's interesting. 
when you read that full story, right after it talks about the Spirit of God resting on them, Spirit there is used four different times in that short section. Ruah, those birds, came because of a great wind, a great ruah. How do we steer our lives? By spirit or by whichever way the wind blows? I think God's kind of laying out our option for us right then. We see spirit, Holy Spirit, here in Numbers, a reflection of how spirit is often used in the Old Testament. We come to our reading this is the standard reading for Pentecost Sunday. Acts chapter 2, the first 21 verses. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Wind. If you're using the, the worship packet, you'll notice that wind is in red there. Um, the things related to the Spirit are in red in your text. Suddenly a sound of the blowing of violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. Remember our father worship? <clears throat> he makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled. The fire rested. The Spirit filled. And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? And then I'm going to, the reading's there, but I'm going to skip to verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Isn't it interesting how when the Spirit moves, some people recognize it and others belittle it? Verse 14, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now, if you know somebody who's a drunk, you know that nine in the morning really doesn't make a difference. But for the casual drinker, and I think that's what Peter's sharing that time element for. But he's also setting the stage that the likelihood of this many people gathered here to celebrate Pentecost would have been imbibing so much that they're drunk is just ridiculous. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on, in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Obviously, that's all coming from Joel. But I think Peter's making the, the big link to what you're seeing here is what the Spirit does. Because there wasn't anything said about blood and, and billows of smoke and, and moon turning to blood. What he's pointing out is the spirit and vis prophesying and visions and dreams. What you're seeing
seeing here is not a bunch of drunks, it's the work of the Spirit. And it's a display, it's a display so that you will know who they are, just like those 70 elders in the time of Moses. That God will bring out His Spirit so people can identify them, and that by the work of that Spirit, truth can be shared. Peter says, it's been in your scripture, it's been there the whole time. And now it's coming out. Matter of fact, Peter could go on and say, you know, it's what Moses wished for. That everybody would have that spirit. That it wouldn't be something that was highly selective. and That only the elite got to have, and just for sometimes a few moments. But that it would come on all the people, young and old, men and women. And then get this, that Peter shares, the last thing he shares from this prophecy from Joel, verse 21. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter includes that in his quote. Now, Joel has a lot of things that he prophesied about, a lot of things that he foretold was going to happen. Peter could stop with here about the Spirit and skip that, that part about end time signs because it doesn't really relate to what's happening, except he wants to get to that next verse. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The Spirit is here, and this turmoil that you're seeing is to create a sacred moment that if you allow yourself, the Lord can do a saving thing. They're not here for your entertainment. They're not here for their amusement. They're not here just so they could have this connection and they could enjoy it, but that through seeing this, through knowing this, through the prophecy, through the foretelling that they give, that you will come to know who Jesus is and you will be saved. Well, Peter starts with what sounds like a rebuke. Hey, stop making fun of these folks. They aren't drunk. It's the Spirit of God, like Joel told you. He gets to the point of delivering. Here's an opportunity for you to respond to what Jesus has done. That you may be saved. The Spirit isn't here to go through motions. The Spirit isn't here so that we can check off some boxes. The Spirit is here that you might be saved. What an opportunity that folks have. Now, some of you are familiar with the story and you know what comes next. If you're not at your homework assignment, go back and read the rest of Acts chapter 2. Not now. Because now I'm jumping onto another scripture. We're packed in scripture today. This is actually another lectionary reading that's given for Pentecost Sunday. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 13. Um, and uh, on the table when you leave today, uh, both these scriptures, the one from Numbers, the one from 1 Corinthians, they're on a supplemental sheet that's on the table at the rear. Um, and you'll see in there some of the same things, just like there was um, some of the works of the Spirit they were highlighted in yellow uh, from the Acts passage. It was also the Joel passage. Prophesy visions, dream dreams, prophesy. When you get to the, the Corinthians one, you'll see that the things of the Spirit are in red. The work of the Spirit is going to be highlighted in yellow. Um, so it, you'll, that'll make a nice little collection of Spirit from Old Testament to Gospel to the New Testament epistles. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 13. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, in everyone, it is the same God at work. The Trinitarian side of me sees in there Holy Spirit, God the Son, and God the Father. Again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. Now, to each one, each individual, each 
person. Moses wished that everybody could have the Spirit. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. In the day of Moses, when God shared the Spirit with those 70, including the two in the camp, it was not for their benefit, but for the benefit of others, that they would know these people have been trusted. On the day of Pentecost, when so many had the flames come down and the Spirit indwell, it was so that others could be saved. Now to each one of you the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. It's not for the one with the Spirit, but what that one with the Spirit can do. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. Prophesy, foretell. And to another, a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits. And to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. And I see in my notes I missed a highlight there. Trust me, it should have been highlighted when you get to it. Now, I will tell you that I have some sisters that went to a private school that came home upset one day because the teaching at that school was if you do not speak in tongues, you do not have the Spirit, and therefore you are not a Christian. And that's different than my understanding of what the Spirit does. And I think when we look here and see that we're given this list, and it's not an extensive list, it's not meant to be, it's not an all-inclusive list. It's some examples of what the Spirit does. A message of wisdom, a message of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing spirits, and to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. To another. Not everybody got that, and then the rest were divided up. And then still another, the interpretation of tongues. I just want to throw that out there in case you've ever encountered that same confusion. That to be saved, you must have the, the Spirit comes when you're saved, and the proof of that, the sign for others, is speaking in tongues. I do not think the text supports that. All these, this is verse 11, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Peter referenced Joel talking about young and old, men and women. Here we get Jews or Greeks, slave or free. It all gets us back to the numbers. I wish all people had it. There is no barrier. There is no exclusion for the Spirit. All receive it, and it's for the common good. It's for the benefit of others. Remember, Paul talked about this whole idea of speaking in tongues. And, hey, if you can speak in tongues and you're in a worship service and you're ready to speak in tongues and there's nobody to interpret because that's a different gift, then don't do it because it's just going to muddy the waters. It's going to be confusing. And the, the Spirit is not here to be a spirit of confusion. It's for the common good. It's that recognition that each of us has something that we bring. When we're gifted by the Spirit, we have something to offer, and it's for the common good. And so even if we feel like, I don't have anything, I'm not worthy. Again, I don't know if all that and me that back in the camp felt that they weren't worthy, that they couldn't serve. And, and I mean, that's logical. I mean, Moses, he resisted. He said, I can't do that. I, I can't, I'm not a public speaker. I can't do that. And God said, let me give you Aaron. He'll speak for you. He gave Aaron, and then Moses did all the talking anyway. 
We might say there's nothing I have to offer for the common good. God gives us the spirit and says this is for the common good. I gave it to you. You use it. When we think of a Memorial Day, well, when I think of Memorial Day, and I think particularly of those who we remember who wore the uniform and died in service, I tend to think of those who were killed in direct combat. And maybe it's because I tend to watch all those war movies and the grand sacrifice. Um, this is the weekend that all the cable channels play a bunch of movies and I, I probably have 20 different war movies recording. I've probably seen all of them at least twice. I began a yearly tradition. I started the other night going through the Band of Brothers, the HBO series. And seeing those sacrifices. And so you see those on the ships and those in the planes and those on the front lines. I gotta be honest, I don't watch a whole lot of the submarine movies. And you see those heroic deaths. And Memorial Day brings that to mind. But we know that the military is not just those on the front lines. That there are those who served valiantly, made huge impacts in, in World War II or Korea or wherever, who never left the United States. A lot of these stories, and again, I, I, maybe because my dad was a pilot, I tend to read the, the plane stories. A lot of these stories about somebody who was trained and they, they graduated from their training looking for their deployment overseas and they were tapped to be an instructor because they were so good, they were tapped to be an instructor. And they were training others and they couldn't wait to get to the war. But let's face it, if it was your son, would you want him to have the best person training him? Or would you want the guy who barely got by? You want the best. And you wonder how many of those pilots were frustrated that they didn't get to go put their training to use. But how many thousands they may have saved by teaching them the right skills. How many served in the military and were kind of frustrated that they get, didn't get an opportunity to take it to the enemy. And what they did was they served meals back at the camps. Or they maintained the library that provided some recreational reading and opportunity to let your mind go from what you're experiencing that kind of gave a spiritual breath the chaplain who wasn't parachuting down with the troops, but was listening, giving advice, and praying with men and women who were getting ready to get on the ship to be deployed. What a valuable service they were at. See, the military has very few tips of the spear. And there's an awful lot of shaft that get that tip to where it needs to go. It's for the common good. Somebody's got to do the paperwork. Somebody's got to be the one giving the immunization shots one after another. Or otherwise, the tip of the spear doesn't work at all. Spiritual gifts were given for the common good. Your gift matters. 
It might not seem like the most dramatic. You might say, well, I would really want to be the one doing this. This is what the Spirit has given me to do. It's a worthwhile calling. It's valuable. It serves. The gifts of the Spirit serve the common good. The church at large and those who by hearing what the church has to say might be saved. We're like one body with many parts. There's a, a generation that looking here, I don't think anybody really fits it, but some of you know people from that generation that they had an earworm that song that got stuck, and maybe they sang it around you so much, it drove you nuts. There's a generation that kind of grew up, and I heard my daughter talking about it last night, with the high school musical shows Disney did. In 2006, the theme song for the first high school musical was released as a single. We're all in this together. It's a peppy song. It's a fun song the first hundred times, but gets old pretty quick. And I'll have to tell you the choreography, while it was fun, did not necessarily stand up. It's still worth a good watch though. And we're all in this together. It's actually the whole cast singing about coming together. Got things like this. Here and now, it's time for celebration. I finally figured it out that all our dreams have no limitations. That's what it's all about. Everyone is special in their own way. We make each other strong. We're not the same. We're different in a good way. Together's where we belong. Very cheesy in the context of high school musical and watching these actors and actresses dance and sing and the whole gym, of course, notice the choreography. But it also works for those who served in the military and those who gave their lives. All in it together. Each one with different skills. Each one with a calling that when joined, work for the common good. It works for those of us who as we recognize Pentecost and we recognize the work of the Spirit of God in our lives, recognize that we don't have the same gifts and sometimes, gee, I wish I could have done that one or that, that would have been fun. I wish that would be, why can't I do that? We're all in this together. We've got different gifts. We're not the same. We're different in a good way. Together is where we belong. Pentecost should be a day that unites us more and more to serve the greater good, the common good. The chorus, we're all in this together. Once we know that we are, we're all stars and we see that. We're all in this together and it shows when we stand hand in hand, make our dreams come true. Verse 2, we're all here and speaking out with one voice. It might come in different languages, but we're speaking in one voice. We're going to rock the house. The party's on. Now everybody make some noise. Come on and scream and shout. We've arrived because we stuck together, champions, one and all. We've been given a spirit of victory. When we use our gifts for the common good, when we use them to support the church and to draw others to the name of Jesus Christ, that in the name of the Lord, they might be saved. Pentecost reminds us of that. And I think it's okay that Pentecost and Memorial Day weekend get to share a same Sunday here. Because Memorial Day reminds us that the work that is done, while a few get recognized, many are part. And probably there's some that bemoan the fact that they were a dishwasher in Korea whose kids and grandkids are glad that he was a dishwasher and not a marine at the chosen reservoir. There's 
somebody was glad that he came home. We're in this together for the common good. Let's use the things of the Spirit to proclaim the name of Jesus. Let's pray for Holy God, thank you. Thank you that we could once again be reminded of what you have called us to in the way that you have gifted us and that the gift, while it's a blessing to us, is not meant to stay with us. That you have breathed into us so that we can breathe life out. That we can share that spirit. That we can use our gifts. That others may know you and may know you more fully, more deeply. Thank you for this precious gift that we have. Allow us to use it according to your will. Here am I. Send me. This our prayer. In the name of the Son. Amen. <clears throat> our hymn, if you're using the hymnal, hymn number 290, otherwise it's in your worship packet, uh, Pentecostal Power. I'd invite you, if you care to, to stand while we sing.
a reminder that um, outside the doors, this direction, there are some potted palms that have been in the sanctuary since Palm Sunday. They need good, kind, loving homes. Um, I don't want to see them here when I leave, uh, so make sure you, somebody take those. Um, the daily bread devotional readings for the next quarter, beginning with the June 1st, um, are there's some on the table through the sanctuary. There's a box down here if we run out. Uh, feel free to grab those. We talked about sharing gifts, um, and you know, there's the point of the spear, but there's a lot of work that goes beyond that point of the spear. Um, at Misa, uh, I don't know if you want to come on up here and, and uh, share how some of that work might be. With the Memorial Day Parade tomorrow, some of you have already been invested in that work. Um, see that there have been uh, snacks for distribution that have been placed in a lot of different places. And just a few moments after the benediction, I'm going to ask that you find a Misa and see if there's something you can do today uh, to move those things so they're in a couple different locations and gather them at her rallying point. Some of you might be coming back early tomorrow morning to help get things set up, or you might come back to help distribute and greet guests. You might say, look, I didn't get to be out there under the canopy greeting everybody and having a good time. I got stationed in the hallway directing people to the bathrooms. That's a good thing. That's still a work that needs to be done. Some of you might say, well, I can't be there that early because I've got a commitment, but I'll certainly swing by and help clean up and, and put stuff away. That's also appreciated. Anissa, what do you have to share with folks? Yes, just quickly, Chas, pretty much summed it up. Um, anybody who's coming to volunteer tomorrow, I ask that you be here between um, 8.45 and 9, 9.15. Setup does not take that long to do. You just need hands to do it. Um, if you have not given anything, if you want to give something, snacks, anything that's covered, you know, you sell it at BJ's, Shop Frank, Stop and Shop. Um, waters are still always appreciated, and believe me, everything that you bring gets eaten, taken, drinking by everyone outside. So I appreciate it. I'm thanking you in advance. I like the Pentecostal red shoes. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for being here. I hope you've been blessed, and I hope that you have an opportunity to be a blessing to somebody else to use the gifts of the Spirit to use your natural talents to direct others to Jesus Christ, even if it's something as simple as directing them to the bathroom first so that they know we're a welcoming place, that they're welcome in these doors. Receive now the benediction. Go from this place. Go filled with the Spirit. Go seeking to serve the common good. Know that we're all in this together. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. Be a blessing and be blessed. Amen.